Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'm C.A. Murray, and it is my singular privilege and pleasure to welcome you to Secrets Unsealed, Some TV's Worship Service and Sabbath School Hour. Spring has sprung here on the West Coast, and I hope that the flowers are blooming, the days are warm and sunny wherever you are, but today is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, and we thank you for rejoicing and celebrating the Sabbath day with us. We expect a powerful sermon today from Pastor Bohr, an interesting Sabbath school as we work our way through the book of Genesis. God has many blessings planned just for you. So join us and stay with us if you will, and we know that you will be blessed as together we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Come lift your voices and sing praises using hymn number 71, Come Thou Almighty King. Again, we bid you good morning and wish for you a happy and blessed Sabbath. And we welcome you to our Sabbath school study. We love studying the Word of God. And this quarter, we are looking at the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. I'm in the company of our president and speaker, Pastor Stephen Bohr, and associate speaker, Pastor Daniel Miranda. I am C.A. Murray, and we are as pleased as we can be to study the South School lesson with you. Now, before we go into our lesson, I need to say a couple of things. You've been hearing us tease and talk about the Genesis Code. Uh, and I just wanted to, to mention here at, at the very outset, the Genesis Code is really a fabulous study done by Pastor Bohr. The Sabbath School lesson, by nature, cannot really delve into the many ramifications of the things that it discusses because of time and space. So the lesson deals with certainly what happened and the ramifications of what happened. But it, it cannot, because of the space and, and what it's trying to do, it cannot go layer upon layer upon layer. It's not designed to do that. Should you be one of those individuals who likes to dig into a subject and go well beneath the surface, then I suggest to you the Genesis Code. It is one of the finest things I've ever experienced on the book of Genesis, now Pastor Bohr cannot say this since he is the author. He's not allowed to say that and his humility wouldn't, wouldn't allow him to say that anyway. But I can say that for him <laughs> because I've, I've, I've experienced it. I've watched the videos and uh, we are very, very familiar with the Genesis code here 
And uh, mm -hmm. we recommended, I certainly recommended, Dan, I think you agree with I me. I second you. As, as yep. an excellent tool, mm -hmm. if you want more, if you want to study more, if you want to go a little bit deeper, the Genesis Code is something that you want to add to your library and that you want to take out and peruse from time to time. So you will hear us talk about the Genesis Code. That is what it is. Uh, there are hard copy notes and there are DVDs and you can have them both if you contact us here at Secrets Unsealed and Some TV. So having said that, we want to go into our lesson study for today. Pastor, if you will do the reading and Pastor, if you will do the prayer, mm -hmm. we will begin our lesson. All right, our scripture reading comes from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, where in the New King James Version it reads, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Yes. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, we ask for your presence and your guidance. Help us not to wrestle, to wrestle it, but help us to delve into the truths that you have revealed through your Holy Spirit. And more than that, help us apply the scriptures into our lives, that as we study the life of Abraham, we might be inspired with his faith, and we might learn from his mistakes. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 We do not have to adhere slavishly to the lessons, because we're going to assume that you've studied it, because there are a couple things that I want to cover that are not in the lesson per se, but I want to solicit the digest of your pure mind. And and yours also, as we look at some things that appertain to the lesson, but are not expressly expressed in the lesson. Mm -hmm. I want you both to respond to, to this, this first text. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10 says that he looked for a city whose foundations, builder and maker was God. Um, the idea of someone just taking off and going out, following the will of the Lord, not knowing where he is going, what does that say to you about, about Abraham in general and God's relationship with him? It shows to me that he had great faith and he knew God. Uh, because, you know, if he didn't know God, he would have questioned the wisdom in leaving and not knowing where he was going. So it's, it's the ex first exhibis exhibition of Abraham's faith. Yes. Of course, there's some stories that we're going to study in the lesson today which show that he had uh, lapses in his faith. Okay, so we're thinking alike. Our <laughs> 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 minds are heading in the same direction. Because at, at this point, he had to have great faith. Yes. I think you will agree yeah. that this is a demonstration of, of, of great faith. Daniel, do you agree? Yeah, so Paul is elaborating in Hebrews 11 that you were quoting from verse 1 where it says he defines faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Mm -hmm. uh, Abraham had not seen the fulfillment of the promise. Actually, he didn't see the fulfillment of, of the promise. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 4, I believe it's verse 11 or verse 13, that when God promised him the land of Canaan, in reality, Abraham understood that was the whole world. And with that comes the promise of the city whose builder and maker is God. Mm -hmm. Now, um, here in Hebrews 11, also Paul's, Paul talks about Moses who forsook Egypt in verse 27, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. invisible. Yes. So I believe that was the experience of Abraham when he left uh, his home, when he left his parents, his family, he advanced as seeing him who is invisible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Yeah, and you know, not only Abraham looked forward to much, the thing much larger than the promised land. Canaan was a mo model in miniature, was a type yeah. of what they really were looking for. Not only Abraham, but all, all of the patriarchs. Mm -hmm. It says in verse 13, all these died in faith, without receiving the promises, yes. but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of mm. their own. Mm -hmm. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as, is, as it is, they desire a better country that is the heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, mm -hmm. for he has prepared a city for them. Amen. And of course, the city is the one that was built by God. Yes, Amen. yes, yes. So, so they're, they're thinking beyond. They're thinking uh, in much broader terms. Now, this is very, very important because 
of the fact that that Abraham did have lapses in his faith, mm -hmm. and and the burden for us because I think if if the Bible cannot be be uh, made very pragmatic, if it doesn't solve your problems tomorrow when you have to go to work and your boss says do this or you're fired, or you have problems with your neighbor, or uh, you're having problems at school, if, if the Bible doesn't give you tools to deal with those things, then it, 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 it doesn't help you if you cannot find tools to deal with that. So my point is that there are those of us, and I will say us, who have had and will have lapses in our faith. There are times when you will say, God, what are you doing? Mm. I don't understand. I'm going to follow you because I've been following you and you've shown yourself mm. true. But to say I know what's going on, why I'm going through this, why I'm in this situation, I don't know. Mm. But I'll follow you. Hey, can you agree? <laughs> I ag agree absolutely mm -hmm. with that. Uh, you know, it's been our experience. It's not only a theory, yes. but I think it's been the experience of every, every single person. Yes, yes. Dan, you're, you're not younger, but you're not, you're not excused from life. <laughs> I'm sure you've had times when you've said, Lord, I don't know. I, I, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, definitely. And uh, there have been times that um, I have struggled with doubt. Mm -hmm. I have had the evidences of God's guidance in the past. But there are certain points that you don't really see exactly what His will is. And, uh, and, and anyways, I've seen the, land, the hand of God guiding, um, even learning from our own mistakes, yes. as Abraham did. Yes, yes. I've had times when, I, when, when it's obviously, no doubt, that's the move of God. It's mm -hmm. no question in my mind. Then I've had other times when I'm not hearing anything. Yeah. I'm just kind of going the way that seems to be the right way. You know, I'm trusting in the Lord. And, and this is that kind of experience. Leave, you don't know where you're going, you'll know when you get there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, had, I had a similar experience um, when I was in the Texaco conference. I was the ministerial director and evangelist, and they decided to close all of the departments mm. of the conference. And uh, so, you know, I had uh, three calls simultaneously. And of course, how do you know which of the calls is of the Lord, uh -huh. where the Lord wants you to move. <clears throat> uh, my wife and I came for an interview at Fresno Central Church, where I spent t the last 20 years of my active ministry. And uh, it was a very, there was a small group of people in the church who were very, very um, determined that I would not come because, of, because they knew that I'm conservative in music and we would have a traditional worship style and, and they knew that I was theologically conservative. So. Um, we had an interview. At that time, the conference would, would get us together and have a full-scale interview where church members could ask any question they wanted to. Mm. It was very combative. Mm. And uh, it got downright right nasty with a, a few of the questions that were asked. Uh, but, um, you know, after, afterwards, we went to the hotel. My wife says, we're not going there. <laughs> 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 but, but I felt impressed that God wanted us to come here. Mm. I, you know, I don't. I usually don't go by impressions, simply by impressions. Mm -hmm. But as I looked at the challenges that there were in the church, you know, and the potential that the church had, even though I had already accepted a call to teach theology in our school in Puerto Rico in our university, um, I told them that I wouldn't go, and we came here. And if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be sitting here today. True. Mm. Very true. So God, so God knew what He was doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the path that God directs us on is not always the easiest one or the most apparent one. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's the, it's the non sequitur path that God says, that's where I want you to go. Right. And you've got to trust that he knows what you're doing and that what you're hearing is, is, is the voice of God. And I don't think God is opposed to, to you putting out fleeces as mm -hmm. long as they don't take place of <laughs> right. prayer yes. and, and, and consecration and following the word of God. Well, should I marry this heathen? Well, don't put out a fleece because you're going against the word. Yeah. So don't bother with that. <laughs> but there are certain times when, yeah. when God, I need you to open this door, this door, this door, mm. and I will take that as yeah. the voice of God. And that's, that's, that's acceptable. I had a fleece mm -hmm. when my wife said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I put out seven fleeces one time, and God answered six very directly, and the seventh month I gave him a pass on. I said, you gave me six out of seven, I'll take that. Hey, that's good. <laughs> hey, we need to deal with why God told Abraham to leave. Mm -hmm. I'm just mind thinking sorry, alike. That's what I'm getting. That's quite all right. Quite all right. Thunder. Why <laughs> did he tell him? And, and that's that's really Sunday's lesson. Uh, but um, 
wade into that for me, Pastor, because I've got something I want to add to that also. Well, uh, Joshua, chapter 24, I was 2 just and going 3. There. <laughs> you were there too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Okay, um, why don't you go ahead and read it, being that you had it. Let's go ahead. I'm just going to read and I'll let, I'll let you comment. Uh, Joshua 24, uh, verse 2. And Joshua said unto all the people, reading from the King James Version, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in all time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what does God do in verse 3? Verse 3 it says, And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, that's the Euphrates, and led him through out of the land of Canaan, and multiplied his seed, and gave him Isaac. Okay, so that's the first coming out of Babylon, I guess, huh? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what occurs to me? Uh, this, this idea that when you want to start a new thing, you to totally divorce a person from his surroundings, the thing that he's comfortable with. If, if you have a person that is, has served time in prison for drugs, and you send him right back to that drug-infested neighborhood, odds are he's going to fall back. Mm -hmm. So if you want to start a new thing, you want to change a person's direction, where they're going, you want them to think a different way, remove them from their environment and put them in a totally new situation where, one, they've got to depend on God because yeah. they have no roots, they have no society, they have no one to support them, they've got to lean on God. So, and of course, the, and, and I'm trying to just finish this line, many of the ancient kings, when they wanted to rearrange the thinking process of the captives, did the same thing. The Syrians did that. Yeah. The Babylonians did that. Mm -hmm. Take them out, give them new names, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, uh, Abednego, uh, Hanari, Azra, Mish, change their names, rearrange their thinking, and then you can sort of indoctrinate them right. into your way of thinking by removing them from their society. Yeah. So when we look at the book of Genesis and the whole Bible uh, in light of Genesis 3.15 about the seed of the woman, uh, we see Satan's efforts to try to counteract the coming of that seed. And we see after the flood, uh, rapidly there is again in, in like a mixture or a mingling of the mm -hmm. seeds. And even the holy seed, which was uh, coming from, from Shem, uh, was being corrupted with idolatry. Mm -hmm. And it was necessary for God to preserve the holy seed through the lineage of Abraham, of Terah. Uh, and that's why God has to separate Abraham and his family from those corrupting influences of idolatry. And God did that with Moses too. Yes. Not yes. only did kings do it with God's people, but uh, God did it with his people. Mm. Yes. Um, you know, because uh, Moses had had the influence of Egypt the first 40 years of his life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything was artificial, things were corrupt, there was idolatry. So God says, hey, I'm going to have you for 40 years in the wilderness taking care of Jethro's sheep. And there he unlearned yes. many things and he learned many things. So it's good to get away once in a while. Yes. And, uh, and just kind of uh, reconnect with the Lord. Yes, Amen. yes. Um, having said that, it takes my mind to Toll House, California. Amen. We need to <laughs> <laughs> now you're talking my language. It's funny how all these things sort of stir together in the same blender. How, how God wants us to get out of the cities and, mm. and get out of the corrupting influence of the cities. Certainly not to leave the cities as far as our work is concerned right. and our focus of evangelism is concerned. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to be in it. You don't have to be surrounded right. by it, contaminated by it. Uh, it's better to be out, get some fresh air, then go back and work. And of course, that's what our new uh, project is, uh, God calling us out of the city so that we can go back and, and reach the world. You know, and the lesson deals with this specific point. Yes. Not, not with the Toll House property specifically, <laughs> but it, uh, you have this, the story of Abraham and Lot. Mm, mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so, so what you're saying is not digressing from the lesson. It has to do with the part of the lesson. Yes. You know, the choices that Abraham made to remain in the country and Lot to go to the city. Of course, we'll deal with that a little bit later in the lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. One more point, Pastor C.A. Yes. Uh, and when we look at Abraham's departure from Babylon, this has scathological applications also for our, for our time because we, we are told in the New Testament that we are true children of Abraham mm -hmm. through faith. Mm -hmm. So that means that if we're children of Abraham, God 
also expects us to come out of Babylon, spiritual Babylon. Yes. Not only physically, but also spiritually. Yes. Mm -hmm. Babylon also has to come out of our hearts. Mm -hmm. And our hearts need to be purified from worldliness and Babylonian uh, principles. Yes. Amen. So if we are, as Galatians tells us, heirs according to the promise, then that means that all that was promised to Abraham is promised to us in these last days, mm -hmm. including the call to separate ourselves from the, the sin of the world and from churches who do not follow the will and way of God. And, and the truth is, Everybody who calls on the name of Christ is not following the will of Christ mm -hmm. or the way of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so for our, our viewing audience, the best thing you can do is make sure that the church that you are spending your time, your money, and perhaps your salvation in and on is following 100% as far as you can detect mm -hmm. the way of Christ. Amen. Amen. And if you see something in there that is not of Christ, question it. And if it cannot be corrected, then you've got to leave that church and not be so wedded to a doctrine or a person or a way of right. worship, uh, you've got to find the truth. And when you find the truth, then you must follow truth. Hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. Um, so we, we, we move now into what would be the Sunday part, the temptation of, of Egypt. Now, we talk about Abraham at once doing things mm -hmm. that are emblematic of great faith mm -hmm. and then doing things that are <laughs> kind of on his own, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and all of our lives are like that. And that's what I like to say is we're involved in, 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 in production here that we tend to judge people on the snapshot, but I'm so glad that judge, ju God judges on the video. Amen. He judges on the whole tenor of your life, not just one point in your life. Amen. Because if you look at Abraham at this point in his life, mm. well, he's not doing quite as good. Right. Comments, questions. Also later on in life, you know, when, uh, when his wife convinced him to, to link up with uh, Hagar. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a great lack of faith there. Yeah. But, but then he had high points, very high points, mm -hmm. when, when he was willing to take his own son mm. to Mount Moriah and willing to sacrifice him. You know, he had mountaintop experiences and he had valley experiences. And uh, these things were written for our admonition. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, when, well said. When, we're in well the, said. when we're in the doldrums, you know, we're encouraged by his faith. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And, and when we're, and we're at the apex of faith, we say, he that thinks that he's solid and stands, mm -hmm. let make sure that he doesn't fall. Right. A um, couple of things that I'd like to mention. I, I imagine Abraham, he comes here to Canaan, and God says, this is the promised land, and now he, there is famine in the land. Um, and, and I believe his faith was severely tried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we see that Abraham's faith <coughs> fails. And as Pastor Bro was saying, he committed some other mistakes in the future. Now, there is something that the lesson doesn't, doesn't mention, but I have made this connection before, that when we come to Genesis chapter 16, when we see Abraham's sin with Hagar, you know, Hagar was an Egyptian. And uh, where did she come from? I have, the, I have concluded personally that they brought her when, from when they went to Egypt. Mm -hmm. So one small mistakes, mistake leads to future mistakes. Mm -hmm. yeah. This small thing here, just bringing this, uh, this woman from Egypt that was not part of the, of the, of the lineage, uh, now she's living with them, and eventually that's the woman with whom Abraham is going to commit adultery. Mm, mm -hmm. I'm glad that the lesson brought out this very important point. I hadn't thought about this point uh, where, uh, you know, God told Abraham, leave uh, Babylon mm -hmm. to go to the promised land. Yes. But God did not tell him to leave and go, e go to Egypt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was his own unenlightened decision. Right. And so when we follow our own will and unlightened decisions, we suffer the consequences. Indeed, indeed. And that's a very important point, I think, that the lesson brought out. It is. It is. In fact, uh, I, I have a note along in my little margin that I wrote in there. Let's put some legs on this for just a second. Because the lesson gives indication, and you just, just um, elucidated on this, the idea that even though times are tough, we need to stay with God. And opposition does not mean give up on God. It means trust him more. Here then is my question. 
I know of a person who has since passed. He believed in total trust in the Lord. Hmm. He had a cancerous, in fact, I know two individuals, but one stands out in my mind. He had a cancerous growth. He asked God to heal it. And he said, if God does not heal it, I'm not going to get medical help. It's a true story. It happened in the past six years. Mm -hmm. And there were people who told him, you can get that cured. Go to the doctor. You can get that cured. In fact, one doctor told him, in examining him, you are going to die a horrible death if you don't get that taken care of. Mm -hmm. He said, God will take care of it. Well, the Lord did not. And he died. Even when he went into the hospital for the last time, the doctor said, if we go in there now, we can get it. Mm. He said, no, if God doesn't heal me. Reflect on that, Pastor. You and I are about the same, in the same zip code age-wise. So you've been around a long time also. <laughs> uh, but he saw that as an exercise of great yeah. faith. Mm -hmm. There were those who thought that was irresponsible because yeah. he was married, he had a family, uh, and selfish. Yeah. What think of thee? Bottom line is presumption is the counterfeit of faith. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, God uh, obviously did not tell him, you know, I'm going to heal you. That's the only way it's going to work out. God also uses physicians mm -hmm. uh, to, to bring healing to people. Very much agree. And so uh, I feel that it's presumptuous, and I know who you're talking about, that it's presumptuous to say, no, Either the Lord heals me or I'm going to die. The fact is that if he'd gone to the physicians, he would have lived a longer life of service to the Lord yes. than, than his life being cut short. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a person who, uh, the difference between faith and presumption is an individual who's going to take a trip and, uh, and prays, oh Lord, please protect me in this trip, and then drives 100 miles an hour on the trip, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. claiming God's protection and disobedience or, or saying, the Lord is going to bless me in taking this test while I haven't studied. Mm -hmm. You know, that's presumption. Mm -hmm. That's, that's presumption. not faith. Yes. That's presumption. So uh, presumption is the counterfeit of faith. It is not a denial of faith to use the resources we have available to cooperate with God in the fulfilling of the promise. Uh -huh. and, uh, and as Pastor Bohr said, God has... Uh, given wisdom to physicians to help us with, with, with our health issues. There, there was an issue at, uh, at the end, like the, la the last decade of the 19th century in the Adventist church, uh, there was a movement about translation faith or healing faith uh, where prominent leaders like K.T. Jones were teaching mm -hmm. that uh, you, all you have to do is to believe and, and we pray and the person is healed mm -hmm. and that if a person goes and seeks a physician, it's lack of faith. And there are a couple of, of cases that uh, Dr. Kellogg, he was at the sanitarium Battle Creek and, and he had a severe, uh, patients with severe illness. And uh, these patients fell into this and, and they decided, no doctor, we don't want your treatment because uh, we, we have been prayed for already and that's mm -hmm. enough. And eventually these people died and, and yeah. Kellogg blamed it on the ministers uh, because of that, because he was saying God also gives science and God gives physicians. Yeah. Uh, the ability to... Ellen White's counsel yeah. on sanitariums and hospitals and uh, natural remedies be being used in, uh, in the context of a hospital or sanitarium, uh, she would be totally wrong if there wasn't a place for sanitariums and for hospitals Very and for true. medical doctors, you know, who's used, of course, use the right methods of healing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well said, both of you, uh, and, and very much appreciated. Um, there are lapses in, in, and of course, we take Abraham down to Egypt. He's going on his own. He had the promise that God was going to bless him. So he wasn't going to die uh, of famine because Isaac is still in the future. You know, mm -hmm. So he's not going to die now. Right. You know, I, I, I used to tell my children, I don't know how I'm going to die. I just know how I'm not going to die. I'm not going to die of lung cancer from cigarettes. I'm not going to die of alcoholism. You know, there's a whole list of ways I'm not going to die. I don't know how I will, but I know how I won't. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't going to die of starvation now because the promise was yet to be fulfilled. Exactly. Yeah. And you can take that you can trust. So it's not presumption to lean on promises of God. God says, prove me, try me, test me. 
and see if I will not fulfill. Yeah. So he could have stayed there and trusted God, and God would have shown himself faithful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, Abraham had another lapse with Abimelech later on. Yes. Yeah, same thing. Same, same thing. thing. All over same again. thing. <laughs> he didn't learn from the first lesson. <laughs> and Isaac later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's a, but he told the truth, didn't he? Sarah was his sister. Was a half. Yeah, 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 yeah. So a half truth is a full lie. Yeah, the full lie. Well said. Well said. You know, we, we talk about, I understood the term father of the faithful one way when I was younger. You know, we, we talk about the mother of all storms or the mother of all, which means the greatest of all. And I used to think of father of the faithful in that in that sense, he was the greatest, had the most faith of anybody in the world. <laughs> and then you study his life, you know, no, nope, got to be another explanation. That's not it. He's the father of a faithful people, right. of the people who were in the line of faith. But it doesn't mean that he was the most faithful person, mm -hmm. because we see over and over again his faith failed him, uh, and yet God used him uh, those times when he did that. Ellen White uses this as an example of why we can believe that the Bible is true. You know, because the works that are written about uh, heroes, mainly after they're dead, is to say everything good about them. Mm, mm -hmm. Nothing Well bad. said, yeah. The Bible brings out both the virtues mm -hmm. and the defects of the greatest heroes. And that's one of the evidences that the Bible is true because it doesn't, it do, it's not politically correct. It doesn't make people look better or worse than they really are. It right. tells it like it is. Yeah, yes. yeah. You see them warts and all. You find out that 40% or more of the Bible is written by people who, who have murdered people in their lives. Yes. So you, you see the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know. Uh, and, and, and the thing is that God can, through all of this humanity showing up, God can still fulfill his promises. Amen. And there was always a line of faith. Amen. Amen. So it doesn't weaken your confidence in the Lord. It strengthens it. Amen. I was going to mention something that I've been asked several times. And... It has become common in certain circles about the situational uh, ethic. Mm. Uh, so some people might say, well, Abraham was justified for his life because his life was in danger. Uh, is, is lying or any other sin justifiable when we're facing death or a danger? The bottom line is that this example shows very clearly that Abraham committed the mistake of trying to read the future. Yes. <laughs> we usually say, well, if I do this, what will the consequence be? Mm -hmm. We don't know the consequence. Abraham didn't know the consequence was going to be that Pharaoh wanted to kill him. Pharaoh prospered him. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, and, and he had to rebuke Abraham and say, why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? You know, because the curse of God would have fallen upon him. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, the problem with situation ethics is that you try to re read the result Mm -hmm. based on the premise. That's yes. the point. And, and you can't because only God knows the future. Mm. We need to do what is right because it's right, Ellen White says, and leave the consequences with Amen. God. And that's very, And we very can always true. be on the right path when yes. we do that. Yes, Amen. yes. God can rearrange situations. God is not impotent because we have no clue. doesn't mean God is clueless. God has an answer and we need to trust him to provide the right answer at the right time. Mm. All righty. Abraham and Lot. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> we move now to Abraham and Lot. The question is asked in the lesson, and I think this is a good question. What does this story teach us uh, about the importance of character? We, one of the things, you know, that we, we, are, we are taught over and over again is um, how can you love God and say you love him who you cannot see when you cannot love those who you see every day? So part of your demonstration of your love for God is how you treat those for whom mm. Christ has died, mm -hmm. how you treat men and women who, who may or may not treat you as you want to be treated, mm. uh, but you don't return evil for evil. Mm. Ellen White says kindness is never out of place. Forgiveness is never out of place. Uh, we always try to lead with these things. Um, the second paragraph in the lesson, I just want to read one line. Abraham's connection with God already shows in his relationship with people, in the way that he handles the problem with Lot. Abraham may not have been perfect, but he knew who God was. Mm -hmm. He knew how to rely on God. Mm -hmm. And when he had troubles, he knew how to find God. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and that's a good lesson for us today. Pastor, you have something you want to add to that? 
I want to say that, uh, you know, children sometimes make decisions contrary w by, to what they've been taught by their parents. Mm. That doesn't mean that the children don't love the parents. Yes. It means that they have lapses where they decide to go independent. It doesn't mean that they've broken their relationship with their parents necessarily. And so the same is true in our relationship with God. You know, the fact that sometimes we blow it, so to, so to speak, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we no longer love God or God doesn't love us. Yes. It simply means that we have to get back on track mm -hmm. and continue walking the way that he would have us walk. Amen. Amen. Dan, anything you want to add to that? Well, I, I just see in regards to your question here about the, what does this, this story teach us about the importance of character. Um, I am encouraged by Abraham's example that he being the patriarch mm. shows himself a humble man by letting Lot choose first. And the lesson brings out a very important point here where it says that in contrast, Abraham's move was an act of faith. Abraham did not choose the land. It was given to him by grace. But Lot chose the land mm -hmm. where he wanted to be. Right. Good point. Yes, yeah. very good point. I have that underlined in my, in my lesson also. The fact that Lot chose where he wanted to be, mm. and he chose near the city because that's where his head and his mind and his heart were. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I want to be. We are choosing, and it, it always comes back to Toll House, you know. Yeah. We are choosing to be out. Of the, <laughs> we Amen. are choosing to be out of the city because that's where we know that God wants us to be. Amen. Amen. And, and it makes us more effect, effective witnesses for the Lord. Does anything else jump out at either of you as we look at Abraham and, and Lot? Well, you know, it, it gives us the impression that Lot did not immediately go to Sodom. Uh, it says the, he, he, he step by step moved yes, towards yes, the city, yes, 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 towards Sodom. Yes. And, he, and of course, he ended up in Sodom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think if I can just throw out this question now, um, there seems to be a contradiction, and I say seems is the word. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a contradiction. Uh, between Genesis 19 and 2 Peter chapter 2. In Genesis 19, I've always been a little bit perplexed about Lot's attitude. He had become defiled also uh, with, even though he, he hated what the, what the Sodomites did. At the same time, he had come, become adapted somewhat to Assimilated. that. Assimilated. Because, yes. because yes. when the angels, when, when the men of Sodom gathered around his house, and said, send out these men because we want to know them. Lot said, I have two daughters that haven't had sexual relations. He's offering his daughters. Yeah. And yet in 2 Peter chapter 2, um, in verses 7 and 8, uh, it says something very interesting about him. So he, he was distressed by the behavior in the cities, but he kind of acquiesced to it mm -hmm. because it says in verse 7 and if he rescued righteous lot notice that the t number of times this word righteous is used and if he rescued righteous lot oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day by day with their lawless deeds uh, so, so, you know, there's a point where you say, what's really happening is terrible when you live in the city. But at the same time, uh, you, you know, even though you're against the actions, yes. you kind of uh, adapt to them, yes. ad adapt your yes. mind to them, although you don't practice them. Yes, yes. That's what I, I felt from reading Ellen White, that he had, he had developed a sort of detente with the city. He had kind of realized, I passed it in New York City for 30 years. All of my churches in New York City. And you just adjust, you know. But, but in your adjusting, uh, it, it is easy to go too far. I think that, that that's a very, a very good point. And, of course, as indicated by his, his, his willingness to surrender uh, his girls to the mob. It, it disturbed him being there, but he adjusted. And that's, that's always the way it is when, when righteousness and evil kind of come together. Sadly, righteousness tends to... Mm. get lost and of course the history of mankind is 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 that history also mm -hmm. all right um time getting away from us i'm looking at the clock on the wall um the babel coalition now this is an interesting part of the <laughs> lesson interesting yes. yeah <laughs> 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 um yeah. the lesson asks the question because it, it's it's genesis chapter 14 verses 1 through 17 i read them over again just a little bit ago um 
walk us through, Pastor, if you will, uh, set the table for us, sort of unpackage this. We've got uh, a battle going on, which is indicative of, of something else that's just below the surface. So what's happening here? Well, you know, I think it'd be, it might be a good idea for us to read it because it's quite complex. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of it personages involved. Mm -hmm. So maybe it'd be a good idea to read it so that people get the picture. We still have a few minutes. Uh, so who's the good reader? All right, we're in Genesis 14, reading verses 1 through 17. Uh, let, let's divide it up. Get uh, Daniel, take uh, verses 1 through 7, if you will. Okay. All right, uh, Genesis 14, verses 1 through 7, it says, And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Velazar, Kidor Lamuer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the vale of Sidim, which is in the salt sea. Twelve years they served Kidor Lamoer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Kedor Lamoer and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephims, and Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and Zuzims, and Ham, and the Enims in Shabe, Kiriathai, and the Horites in, the, in their mouth Zir, and to El Perin, which is by the wilderness. Verse 7, And they returned and came to Emnishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazazon Tamar. Okay, amen and amen. Pastor, if you'll take 8 through 14. I'm glad I don't have as many names. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a few. <laughs> And the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bila, that is Zoar, came out, and they arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Sidim, against Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariak, king of Eleazar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the hill country. Is that uh, as far as you want me to read? Uh, to fled to, I've got fled to the mountains. That's, uh, take two more. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply and departed. And they also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. So here you have basically a world war at that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and verse 13, Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees in Mamre, and the Amorite, brother of Eskol, and brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. And verse 14, Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive. He armed his 318 mm. trained servants who were born in uh, his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, this, these are his personal servants. This is an interesting story. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus, so he brought back all the goods and brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. Oh, 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is uh, the king's valley, after his return and uh, from the defeat of the Kedorlomar, Kedorlaomar, and the kings who were with him. Interesting. So I see the bottom line here. Um, you know, most of these kings were coming from Mesopotamia, from Babylon. Yep. So the bottom line here, what I see, and uh, the lesson brings it out, is that the land of Canaan that was going to be the possession of Abraham in the future was being threatened to be possessed by Babylon. 
Again, we're seeing here a, a conflict between God, you know, and also Babylon. Because uh, the reason why I believe the Bible mentions this and with these ancient civilizations is not so much because of the war, but because what was at stake mm -hmm. yeah, with that war. And, uh, and we know that Abraham is in the middle of all this turmoil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Daniel, I fully agree with what you said. Um, whenever we find the word Babylon or Shinar there in Genesis, because Genesis is a prophetic book, not only a historical book, mm. we need to see the connection with the end time. Mm. You know, this battle is really a reflection, a local reflection of a much larger battle at the end of time between Babylon and God's faithful remnant, God's faithful people. Mm. Amen. I want to add, um, again, I think this is where the Genesis code shines so very brightly because we have all thought of Genesis as not purely historical, but certainly mostly historical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you find quickly as you're looking at the Genesis code, that there are not only parallels, but there are certain uh, prophetic nuances to the book that uh, bespeak uh, the first coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, mm -hmm. and what's going to happen just before the second coming yes. of Christ. So it's, it's all there in the book of Genesis. So it gives Genesis another land. This is one of the things that I was saying that the Sabbath School lesson simply can't bring out because it doesn't have the time, doesn't have the space. But the Genesis Code does so very, very beautifully. I thought about calling the Genesis Code the beginning of the end. <laughs> because it kind of kind of puts the beginning and the end together. Indeed, indeed, it does. Uh, Dan, I think your your point is is well taken. Particularly um, when you when you see Shinar, that's kind of like a little flashing red light to say, okay, mm -hmm. something else is happening here. There's something be. And not be, only Shinar, uh, yeah. but other names that are used there Elam. also Elam yeah. are also yes, from yes, the same yes. region. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else before we leave this this? Well, you know, another point here, very important, is that, um, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah were such wicked cities, as we read, mm. but yet the presence of a righteous man brought blessing to these cities, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. before God destroyed them. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe with this act, uh, God, and, and I believe next week uh, we'll be studying about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, or, or maybe not, uh, but uh, it makes a, a, a short mention here in, in this week but before God brings judgment, He gives people opportunity to know Him and mm -hmm. to accept Him. Yes. And I believe this was providential so that the, the king of Sodom and Gomorrah and also the people uh, might be familiar or, mm -hmm. or exposed to the God of Abraham. Mm -hmm. right. uh, before God could later in the following chapters bring destruction upon these cities. Yeah. And related to that, you know, uh, Abraham's witness in this particular experience. In this particular experience, exactly. But, but repeatedly in these chapters, we notice that wherever Abraham, wherever he went, he built an altar. Yes. And Ellen White states that sometimes the Canaanites would come by the altar and they would remember what Abraham had taught them about the coming of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, Abraham was a witness there, not only in this episode when he goes out to battle and recovers everything that was lost, mm. but also by building an altar wherever he went as a witness. Yeah. And that's why he is called in Genesis 14, verse 13, Abram the Hebrew. The first time that word appears in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And Hebrew in the Hebrew means someone from beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, and there have been some excavations of different altars uh, in comparison with the Israel, Israelite or Abraham's altars and the altars of the Canaanites. And they were much different. Their altars mm -hmm. were embellished were uh, polished, but his altars were more simple, so they could, they could tell the difference. And whenever they would see Abraham's altars, they would say, someone from beyond, that is an expression referring to beyond the river, mm -hmm. someone from beyond the river lives and has dwelt here. Yeah. And that's where the word Hebrew comes. And I like that because if we are spiritual Hebrews, we're people from beyond, Amen. beyond right. the river, from right. heavenly Canaan. Más allá del sol. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> amen and, and Far amen. Far beyond the sun. Amen. <laughs> we need to get to, before our time slips away from us, uh, Melchizedek. Um, uh, uh, let me ask before, I've got a little something here. Pastor, do you want to weigh in on this Melchizedek? 
Well, some people believe that Melchizedek was actually Christ or the Holy Spirit oh. because it says without father, without mother, without beginning or ending of days. But that was just a figure of speech back then for mm -hmm. somebody whose genealogy was unknown. Right. Uh, so it doesn't mean that he didn't have a father or mother or that he didn't have a beginning or ending of days, ending of days, but we simply don't have a record of it. And he uses that uh, to justify the fact that Jesus had the right to the priesthood through Melchizedek because he didn't have the right to the priesthood through Judah. To Judah, That's correct. the whole argument in, in uh, chapter 7 of Hebrews. Okay, and, and that was the basis of my argument, the last part, that he didn't come through Judah and was not justified through Judah after the order of Melchizedek. Pastor Daniel, anything you want to put in here before our time slips away? You know, I, basically I believe uh, purposely God hides, hides this information about Melchizedek so that my, Melchizedek can serve as a type of Jesus Christ, of mm -hmm. his priesthood. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. He was mm -hmm. a priest and king. Mm -hmm. yes. Jesus is a priest, a priest and king, and but a he's a king, king according to the tribe of Judah. Yes. He's a priest. He couldn't be a priest according to, to the tribe of Levi because he wasn't from the tribe of Levi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there had to be a different priesthood that, that could uh, justify Jesus serving as a priest, and that's the priesthood of Melchizedek. Yeah, and uh, here uh, we see the mention of true worship because Abraham recognizes that God is the creator or the possessor of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. yes. when he gives the tithe to, to Melchizedek in mm -hmm. verse 22. So we see all these things together. The tithing is the response, uh, a gratitude or a thankful response mm -hmm. to God as our creator, yeah. as the possessor of everything. It's a recognition, it's a recognition that everyth yes. everything that we have belongs to God. Amen. Amen. It's, it's, a, it's the token <laughs> <laughs> that everything that Amen. we have belongs to God. Amen. Yes. There are times in, in, in this story when Abraham really washes his own face in the mud, but there are times when he stands uh, so beautifully as uh, an emblem of the faithful people. Mm -hmm. And his faith in God shines so very, very strongly. Just because you slip and fall does not mean that God is done with you. I think mm. you would Amen. agree. Amen. Um, it's not necessarily a commentary on your walk with the Lord. Uh, when you have those bad times, the righteous fall seven gets up seven yeah. and continues to walk with the Lord. Amen. And does, Abraham's what, life shows that in a very beautiful way. Pastor. What does a baby do when the baby falls? Says, oh, I give up. No, he doesn't. He gets up <laughs> and walks again, bumps again, yes. gets up again yes. until he learns yes. how to walk. Yes. Nobody walks without falling. <laughs> it's like when I was teaching my, my wife to roller skate. Down she went, down she went, but she was determined, and finally she got it. <laughs> and we praise the Lord for Amen. it. We trust and pray that this lesson has been a blessing to you. Our time has fast slipped into eternity. Allow me in closing to wish you both grace and peace through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll get, see you again soon. Bye-bye, and God bless. Well, that was a very engaging Sabbath school study. I trust that we all enjoyed it and we learned very much and it helped our own spiritual walk with the Lord. Now, before we begin the worship service, we want to have a word of prayer. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, as we enter the worship service, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. I ask, Lord, that you will soften hearts, that you will open minds, that we might be edified, and we might be empowered to share this wonderful message that you have given to us. I ask, Lord, that you will bless each person who will hear this presentation. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading is found in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 1. This is the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. May the Lord add a blessing to his word. The Best Boy That Ever Lived, Part 2. You know, Mary had taught Jesus, oh, so much to look forward when he went to the Passover services in Jerusalem. And his first visit, oh, he was so excited. Well, when he went there, he saw for himself 
and it made such a deep impression upon him. And as he was there and taking everything in, he realized that everything pointed to the Messiah. He thought to himself, would the Messiah have to die himself a sacrifice? Thus the mystery of his own mission gradually opened before him. And there in Jerusalem, there was a school attached to the temple and Jesus went to see it. Here he was, it was that he began asking questions of the priest and the teachers and they were so amazed how much he knew about the scriptures. They began asking questions of him. So interested did they become that they did not want the boy to leave when he was there. Hours slipped by, and meanwhile, the people who had attended the Passover services began to leave. Joseph and Mary went with them, having learned to have perfect trust in their son. And knowing that he would never, ever do anything wrong when they went on their way without a worry. So even, even though he wasn't with them, Jesus was so trustworthy, so reliable, so they supposed he was with his friends and they would catch up with him and he would catch up with them. But then several hours passed by and he did not appear. They began to fear that some harm must have happened to him. So they started back to the city. They said, oh no, let's go back. And they started to ask everyone that they met, have you seen Jesus? Oh, our little boy, you know, have you seen him? He's just 12 years old. Can you tell us where he is? He, oh, she was getting anxious. Some said that they had seen him during the Passover, but nobody knew where he was now. So Joseph and Mary went all the way back to Jerusalem, getting more and more anxious every minute. Now, where to go? In her heart, Mary knew there was only one place Jesus liked to be. And it wasn't the place of amusement. It was the temple. So they made way for the temple. And she said, is our Jesus here? They both asked Mary and Joseph. And they said, yes, he was there. All right. And you can see what he was doing. He was with the teachers and the priests studying and asking questions. And oh, they were just having a wonderful time talking about the scriptures and the mission. Oh, how exciting it was for Jesus and the priest and the teachers. So, yes, he was there, all right. Not just playing with other boys of his age that might have been, but sitting in the midst of the teachers, both hearing them and asking them questions. Oh, they were enjoying themselves, all right. They had never, ever met a boy who knew the scriptures so well and who understood their meaning so perfectly. And his questions, they were the wisest, wisest questions. And they even found him hard to answer. As Mary looked on the scene, she was amazed as well. But she was so happy to find her son. Oh, very happy. She ran right to him and she said, Oh, why have you treated us like this? You have made me so anxious and why, what happened? And he said, behold, I have, he said, um, you, why, uh, excuse me. She said, equally surprised to his mother and perhaps a little sorry about this wonderful meeting. He says, why have you sought me? He asked, was he not that I must be my father's business? My father's business? That was a strange thing for a boy to say. The, the um, teachers heard him say it and wondered what he meant. How could this man, Joseph, they thought, a mere carpenter of Nazareth, have any business in the temple? But Mary knew what he meant. Oh, yes. Jesus was not thinking of Joseph. He was thinking of God. He believed that in learning more of the scriptures and storing up the wonderful, wonderful truths in his mind, he was doing God's business and preparing himself for what 
God would call him to do. And when he was all growing up, still, this, this is still God's business today for you and for me. Some people think that spending time studying the Bible or going to church or hear a preaching of the word of, the God, of God is wasting time. Oh, it isn't. Let me tell you, no, it isn't. It is the most important thing we can do. It is our Father's business, and in doing so, we are helping to make ourselves strong and wise for the task of, that God will call for us to do for Him in days to come. And you can see here, Mary, when she sees her son, she's so excited to see her son. And here are the teachers that were asking them questions and, and searching the scriptures together. Oh, yes, it is our mission together, just like Jesus, to study and to know. So when Jesus calls us, we'll know what our mission is to do.
Some TV is a worldwide Christian ministry providing Christ-centered programs with clarity and power on topics such as Bible prophecy, end-time events, Bible interpretation, tips for helpful living, cooking demonstrations, and much more. Our programs provide practical counsel for daily life and assurance in these uncertain times. Download the free Sum TV app or watch online at sumtv.org. You will be blessed. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, as we come before your awesome throne, we do so reverently. As we open your holy word, we ask that you will help us to be reverent in the way that we handle it. I ask, Lord, that you will enlighten us, that you will empower us, and that you will bless us as we open your word and as we study it. We thank you for the privilege of prayer, and we know that when we pray in faith, you listen and you answer, and we claim your promise to be with us in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 24 and verses 21 and 22. Here we find Jesus in his Olivet Discourse warning about the great tribulation that is soon to come upon this world. I'd like to read verses 21 and 22 of Matthew 24. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The worst time of trouble ever. No time of trouble like it before, no time of trouble like it after. Some Seventh-day Adventists when they look at this time of trial and tribulation, are filled with fear. I've even heard some Seventh-day Adventists say, I hope the Lord lays me to rest before that time comes. Furthermore, when I speak about these things, some individuals accuse me of being a fear monger or an alarmist. But today we're going to see that we have no reason whatsoever to fear. No reason to be anxious because God's people have a defending angel, Israel's guardian angel. His name is Michael. Now the specific name Michael is used only five times in the Bible. It's used three times in the Old Testament and twice in the New Testament. And so what we want to do is examine the name Michael as it appears in Scripture. Now I must mention also that Michael is mentioned in other passages, but the specific name Michael is not used. For example, he's called the Prince of the Host. He's called the Angel of the Lord. He's called the Prince of Princes. He's referred to as the angel of the Father's presence, and he's called the great prince. What is the meaning of the name Michael? Well, the name Michael is a compound name composed of three words, me, ka, el. And when you put all those three words together, the meaning of the name is who is like God. So whenever you hear the name Michael, you know that it means who is like God. In other words, it's a name that is a challenge. And I would add something to the name. Uh, we're going to see uh, something about this a little bit later in our study today. I would say who is like God and who is able to make war with him. Now, in the five references to Michael in the Bible, these references have three common denominators. The first common denominator is that Michael is always in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Satan. The second common denominator is that in the battle, Michael always wins. And the third element or the third component is that when Michael wins, his people win with him. 
So there are three common denominators. Michael is always in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Satan. Secondly, Michael always wins. And in the third place, God's people win when Michael wins. So let's take a look at the first two references to Michael that are found in the Old Testament. And before we do, let me just mention one other thing. The name Michael, as it appears five times in Scripture, four of them describe past events. Only once is the name Michael used in the context of future events from our time. So four times Michael refers to historical events that already took place. Once it refers to the future, to a time that has not come yet. So let's go to our first reference, which is Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. There it says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is Gabriel speaking, by the way, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, who is really Satan, withstood me. In other words, here you have uh, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, Satan, Satan uh, withstanding or fighting with Gabriel. And he did it, it says here, for 21 days. And then it says, And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been there, left alone there with the kings of Persia. So notice in this first uh, verse where the name Michael is used, you have a struggle, a struggle between the prince of Persia, a symbol of Satan, and uh, Gabriel. And Gabriel uh, evidently cannot prevail against Satan, so Michael comes to help Gabriel in his struggle with Satan. So the first reference has to do with the battle between Satan and Gabriel, and Michael comes to help Gabriel in his struggle with the kings of Persia. Now, in order to understand this verse, we need to look at the historical context. Israel was in captivity to the Babylonians from the year 605 till the year 536. In fact, this is the 70 years of captivity that was mentioned by Jeremiah in chapter 25 and verses 11 and 12. But in the year 539, three years before the 70 years came to an end, Babylon fell. And of course, that is described in the book of Daniel, chapter 5. And then in the year 536 B.C., according to Ezra, chapter 1, and verses 1 to 4, Cyrus, king of Persia, gave a decree for God's people to go back to the land to rebuild the temple. So I want you to have the historical context clear. 605 to 536, 70-year captivity in Babylon. 539, three years before 536, you have the fall of Babylon. And in the year 536, when Babylon falls, you have a decree given by Cyrus for God's people to go back to the land to rebuild the temple. Now the people had already returned to exile, uh, from exile, and began to build the temple. But the interesting thing is that they met all kinds of opposition as they were trying to rebuild the temple. In fact, the Samaritans who had remained in the land while Israel went into captivity, they actually write, wrote letters to the kings of Persia complaining that the Jews were rebuilding the temple. The book of Ezra actually tells us that during the reigns of King Cambyses and King Darius I, first, the work of rebuilding the temple was suspended for a time. Now, if the book of Ezra was our only source to describe uh, this period, this difficult period when these two kings of Persia shut down the project of rebuilding the temple, we might think that the opposition was simply human due to human factors. But Daniel chapter 10, the verse that we read, gives us a glimpse behind the veil of history. Here we discern that human events in the visible earthly realm are only repercussions of a battle that is taking place 
in the invisible world. And so here you have Gabriel and you have the prince of Persia struggling with the kings of Persia, Gabriel trying to convince them to favor the Jewish project and Satan trying to discourage them. Who won? Well, we know now, many, many centuries and millennia afterwards, that Michael prevailed. And when Michael prevailed, along with Gabriel, the result was that God's people prevailed as well. Now let's go to the second reference, which is Daniel chapter 10 and verse 21. Daniel 10 and verse 21. There were still many battles to be won. Let's read verse 20 and verse 21. Then he, that is Gabriel, said to Daniel, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. In other words, what Gabriel is saying here is that there are still battles to be won against the prince of Persia, against Satan. And then verse 21, But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. So Michael the prince is upholding Gabriel in his fight against the prince of Persia, against Satan, because Satan is trying to keep the decrees from being proclaimed, from God's people going back to reestablish their religion and their uh, sanctuary system, and Gabriel is trying to help that happen. And ultimately, we have the three common denominators. First of all, there's a battle between Gabriel and Michael and Satan. Secondly, Michael and Gabriel win. And in the third place, when Michael, who helps Gabriel, wins, the result is that the people win also. Now let's go to the third reference, which is found in Jude 9. Now I know that I said that there are three references in the Old Testament, but I'm going to save the last one because that one is still future. We're going to study that last in our message today. So let's go to Jude 9. It says there, Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So once again, we have here a contention or a conflict between Michael the archangel and the devil. So once again, you have a struggle. Now this is the only time where Michael is called the archangel. Now the question is, what were they contending about? Well, we already read it. They were contending over the body of Moses. Now, let me just say that Michael does not contend over a dead corpse. Michael had actually come with the intention of resurrecting Moses from the dead. And you say, how do we know that he came to resurrect Moses? Well, it's very simple. Several hundred years later, actually probably 1,400 years later, we find Moses talking to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and Jesus talking to Moses. So if Moses appears to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration about 1400 years later, it must be that Moses resurrected. Now what, what, what happened there? Well, Moses was actually dead and buried, and the Bible says in Deuteronomy 34 that God buried him, and Satan wanted to keep him in the, in the tomb. But Michael the archangel came with the intention of resurrecting Moses and Satan contested his right to do so because Satan said Moses sinned. He killed the Egyptian and then he struck the rock, struck the rock twice and therefore he ha you have no right to resurrect him and to take him to heaven because he's a sinner and the wages of sin is death. But what Michael says, Michael remember is Jesus who is like God. He says, yes, but Moses had faith in my future sacrifice. Moses believed that I was going to die and I was going to resurrect from the dead and that I would forgive his sin legally because the blood of animals could not take away sin, but my blood will take away sin. That's what the argument was about. And so Michael took Moses to heaven, 
based on the promise that he was going to die on the cross to be able to forgive the sins of Moses. So let me ask you, is there a battle in this verse? Certainly, between Michael and Satan. Who wins? Michael wins. And who wins with Michael? Moses, because Moses resurrected, he was taken to heaven, and he actually came down, and he spoke to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now let's go to the fourth reference of Michael. It's found also in the New Testament, Revelation chapter 12 and verses 7 through 12. It's a long passage, but it has very many important details. Once again, Revelation 12, 7 through 12. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. So notice once again, Michael and Satan are in battle. They're fighting one another. Verse 8, but they did not prevail. That is Satan and his angels. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. In a moment I'm going to uh, explain uh, what casting out this is referring to. Verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they, that is the brethren, overcame him, that is overcame Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. Now we discover some very interesting things in this passage. First of all, we discover that Michael commands the angels. It says Michael and his angels. And Satan also has his angels. So you have two leaders of two battalions, Satan and the wicked angels that fell with him, and Michael, who would be Christ, who comes back to this earth with his angels. Now, this passage reminisces about an original casting out of Satan from heaven, uh, according to Isaiah chapter 14, and verses 12 to 14. But in context, this is talking about a casting out of Satan when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. You read John chapter 12, verse 30 to 33. Jesus says, now, the, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. In what sense was Satan cast out when Jesus died on the cross? Folks, it was in the sense that before this, Satan had stolen the position of Adam. Satan had become the ruler of this world. The original ruler was Adam. When Jesus died on the cross, he recovered what Adam lost. Jesus now is the legal representative of this world. Satan was cast out as the representative of this world. Remember, he could go to heavenly councils according to the book of Job. A second way in which Satan and his angels were cast out from heaven at the cross is when the heavenly beings, when the heavenly loyal angels saw what Satan did to Jesus in Gethsemane and on the cross, any little ounce of sympathy they might have had for Satan, for, for a Satan and his angels was totally gone. They were cast out in the sympathies of the heavenly beings. You say, how do we know that this is talking primarily about the casting out of Satan at the cross? Well, let me give you two reasons. First of all, it tells us that when he was cast out, for some time before he had been accusing the brethren. Now, when he was cast out originally, there were no brethren to accuse. And so clearly, he's been accusing the brethren for a period of time, and then he is cast out. Secondly, we are told that the brethren overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So in other words, this can't be the original casting out because the lamb was not slain before 
uh, before sin entered this world when Lucifer sinned in heaven. And so this is talking about a casting out primarily of Satan in the sympathies of the heavenly beings and as the ruler of this world when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. So we've examined four references to Michael, two in the Old Testament, two in the New Testament. We have one yet to study, which is the only one that refers to future events. Now let's take a look for a little while to some references to Michael where the name is not used, but you know that it's talking about the same being. Let's go to the book of Joshua, chapter 5, and verses 13 through 15. Joshua 5, 13 through 15. The context is that Israel has entered the promised land. They've surrounded the city of Jericho, and uh, they're going to conquer the city of Jericho. Now, the commander of the Israelite armies, the visible commander, was Joshua. But there was also an invisible commander behind the visible one. Let's read about it in... Joshua 5, verse 13 through 15. And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No. But as commander of the army of the Lord, the, the commander of the army of the Lord is the commander of the heavenly hosts and also the commander of the hosts of Israel, even though there's a visible commander who is Joshua. So once again, verse 14, so he said, no, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And what does Joshua do? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army came, said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. Three interesting characteristics that indicate that this being, this angel of the Lord, this commander of the Lord's host, was actually God, was actually Michael, Jesus, in his pre-incarnate state. What are those three things? First, Joshua bowed and worshiped him. Secondly, Joshua called him my Lord. And in the third place, Joshua had to take the sandal of his foot because the, the ground that he was standing on was holy. You're going to see in a few moments the next reference where that happened with Moses as well. Clearly, this being the commander of the Lord's hosts is God, in every sense of the word, according to the context. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 3 and verses 2 through 6, and we're going to see that Michael is not only called the commander of the Lord's hosts, Michael is also called the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Notice Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. Here, uh, the angel of the Lord appears to Moses in the burning bush. This is what it says. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. Now, this is important. Who was in the midst of the bush? The angel of the Lord was in the midst of the bush. Don't forget that. So it continues saying, So Moses looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush does not burn. Now notice who's in the bush. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. Now the angel of the Lord was in the midst of the bush, but now it says that the Lord saw that Moses came up to look and God called him from the midst of the bush. So the angel of the Lord is God. Notice what the angel of the Lord says, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. The angel of the Lord is the same as the commander of the Lord's hosts that we noticed in the book of Joshua. And now notice the angel of the Lord or the Lord 
or God, all three designations are used in the passage, tells Moses who he is. Verse 6, Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid, it, hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. The person who appeared in the burning bush was none other than Jesus Christ. And we know this for certain because later on, about 1400 years later, when Jesus came to this earth, he once said something that we find in Exodus 3. He said to a group of Jews, before Abraham was, I am. And the person in the burning bush identified himself as the I am. Jesus is the I am. Jesus is Michael. Jesus is the commander of Lord's hosts. Jesus is the angel of the Lord. Now I want us to notice verses uh, 7 through 9. Verses 7 through 9 of Exodus chapter 3. And there's a key word that we're going to notice here. It says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Now notice this. So I have come down to what? To deliver. So the angel of the Lord delivers, according to this. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. So very clearly, this angel of the Lord, who also is called God, he's called the Lord, he says, I have come down to deliver my people from bondage. Who is that that delivered them from bondage? It was none other than Jesus Christ. Now let's go to another passage where uh, a person is mentioned, not with a specific name Michael, but we know that this person is actually God. Notice Genesis chapter 32 and verses 9 through 11. This is when Jacob is returning home from Laban's household he hears that his brother Esau is coming to attack him and he's afraid, so he goes by the brook Jabbok and he pours out his heart in prayer to the Lord for the Lord to deliver him from the wrath of his brother. Notice at Genesis 32, 9 through 11. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff and now I have become two companies. And now notice what he prays. This is a prayer of Jacob to God. Verse 11, deliver me. Ah, we found that already in Exodus chapter 3. Now the word is, is here again. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. I, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with my children. And then, of course, a certain being comes and he takes hold of Jacob and now a struggle begins. Who was Jacob struggling with? Well, let's take a look at who he was struggling with. Hosea chapter 12 and verses 4 and 5 tells us that he was struggling with an angel. Now, don't get all hung up because uh, it says a man uh, came uh, to me. Uh, you know, angels sometimes are referred to as men because they appear as human beings. That's their appearance. And we have an example of that in Daniel chapter uh, 9 where Gabriel returns and says, that man, Gabriel. So notice that the person that Jacob is struggling with is really the angel of the covenant. It's Jesus Christ. It's Michael. It's the commander of the Lord's host. It's the angel of the Lord. Notice Hosea 12, 4 and 5. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept. This is Jacob. He wept and sought favor from him. That is favor from the angel. He found him in Bethel. By the way, the name Bethel means the house of God. This same being found, uh, found Jacob in Bethel. That's an important detail. 
Notice what he continues saying. And there he spoke, that is the angel spoke to us. That is the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is his memorable name. Now the icing on the cake, so to speak, is the name that Jacob gave to that place. Not only did that angel appear to Jacob at Bethel, which was the house of God, but he also appeared to Jacob and struggled with him there uh, in the passage that we just read. What name did Jacob give to that place? Genesis 32 and verse 30 tells us, So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. And then he explains why. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. But Hosea tells us he was struggling with the angel. But now he says, I have seen God face to face, which is the meaning of the word Peniel, face of God, and my life is preserved. The angel was none other than Michael the archangel who struggled with Jacob, and that's the reason why he gave the name to the place Peniel. Now let's notice another passage that describes this same being, this same angel, Michael, the commander of the Lord's host, the angel of the Lord. He's given many different names in the Old Testament. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3. Here, this is going to get very interesting. Daniel chapter 3, remember the key word deliver in Exodus 3, and the key word deliver in the struggle of Jacob with this angel who is the Lord. In Daniel chapter 3 and verse 15, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, challenged the three young Hebrews and told them that if, he did, if they didn't worship the golden image, who would be able to deliver them? Let's read. Verse 15, the king says, Now if you are ready at that time, you, at the time that you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And now his question, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hand? Well, the, the three young Hebrews didn't even have to think about their answer. Notice verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve, now here comes a key word, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will, here's the word again, he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Remember that word, it's an important word, deliver. Verse 18, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. So the word deliver is used twice. And then in verse 19, we find the reaction of Nebuchadnezzar. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Ellen White described his face in volume 4 of the Bible Commentary, 1169, Satanic attributes made his countenance appear as the countenance of a demon. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar looked like a demon. And you know the story. The three young men were thrown into the furnace, and then Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace, and he doesn't see three, he sees four. Let's read Daniel chapter 3, 24 and 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of a fire, and they are not hurt. And now listen carefully. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And Ellen White describes that Daniel and his friends had described what the Son of God looked like. So the king knew that the person in the furnace with the three young men was none other than Jesus Christ. But now I want you to notice an interesting detail. Here it says that the Son of God 
was in the midst of the fire with the three young men. But now let's go to verse 28, Daniel 3 and verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, listen carefully, who sent his angel. Now wait a minute, didn't we just read that there was the Son of God? Now it says, He sent his angel, and now notice the word, and delivered. So the, his angel delivers, delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve or worship any god except their own god. And then in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 29, we find the word deliver again. Notice King Nebuchadnezzar makes a decree. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can, here's the key word, who can deliver like this. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 6. Here we find again the key word deliver at crucial places in the passage. The conflict in Daniel chapter 6 is over the law of God, and it has to do with worship. The king gave an illegitimate decree that no one could make a request of any man or any God for a period of 30 days. This was a conflict over the law of God and the laws of men. Daniel was exemplary. In Daniel chapter 6 and verse 5, the enemy said, we can't find anything against Daniel in his day-to-day -day duties. It says there, then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. And so now they get the king, they trick the king into giving the decree, the decree that I mentioned before. Let's read verses 6 through 9. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions." Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now, what did Daniel do when he heard this decree? He said, well, I'll just close the windows. No, he didn't. He was not politically correct. He needed to testify of the true God publicly. Notice verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with the windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. And so now the king sees that he has been tricked and he's sad that he made the decree. Let's read a long passage, very, very important passage, verses 14 through 22 of Daniel 6. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself when he heard that Daniel was, was worshiping his God. And it says, and he set his heart on Daniel, here's the key word, to deliver him. And he later labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of Medes and Persians, that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, listen carefully now, key word, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. He's saying, I can't deliver you, but your God is going to have to deliver you. Verse 17, then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel, the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, 
has your God, whom you serve continually, been able, here's the key word again, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his what? Oh, interesting. Angel in the fiery furnace, now angel in the den of lions. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. He served God continually and he believed or trusted in his God. After this, King Darius gave a decree. It's found in verses 25 to 27. The key word is found twice. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. Now here comes the key word. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has, here's the key word again, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Now we are ready to go to our last reference to Michael. The only reference that is still future. You see, all of the previous ones took place during the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, during the time of Christ, uh, according to Jude 9, uh, Revelation chapter 12, when Jesus died on the cross. The first four were already fulfilled, but there's one that has not taken place yet. And that one is found in Daniel chapter 12, and verse 1. And remember the key word. The key word is deliver. Notice Daniel chapter 12 verse 1. It's describing this time of trouble that we began with in Matthew chapter 24. Time of trouble such as never has been nor ever will be. Notice Daniel chapter 12 verse 1. The context of this, by the way, is that the powers of the earth want to come and destroy God's people. At that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation to that time. And at that time, here's the key word, at that time your people shall be what? Delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Michael is the great deliverer. He delivered the three young men from the fiery furnace. He delivered Daniel from the lion's den. Very interesting. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. You know what the wicked are going to be saying at the end of time? The wicked are going to be saying some very interesting things. Notice Revelation 13, 3 and 4. The whole world is going to be worshiping the beast with the exception of a small remnant. And those who are worshiping the beast and receiving his mark and worshiping the image, we don't have time to explain who the beast is and what the image is and what the mark is. I've done that in other presentations. Go to YouTube, you'll find plenty of them. But the point I want to make here is that the whole world is going to be saying something very interesting. Let's read Revelation 13, verses 3 and 4. And I saw one of his heads, that is of the beast, of Revelation 13, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. In other words, the beast persecuted during the 1260 years in the past, but its wound, which it received in 1798, is going to be healed, and it's going to behave in the future on a global scale the way it behaved in the past. And so it says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Verse 4, So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, now listen carefully, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So they're asking, who is like the beast? 
and Michael is going to stand up at that time and he's going to say, my answer is, who is like God? Mikael, his name, who is like God? In other words, Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 is describing the time when God's people will be in jeopardy, a small remnant, there will be a worldwide death decree against them because they refuse the mark of the beast. And all of the wicked will be saying, who is like the beast? Who's going to be able to make war with him? And the answer is in the name of Michael. Who is like God? When the world is saying, who is like the beast? Jesus is going to say, my name is Michael. Who is like God? And I am able to make war with the beast. Very interesting. But there's another point. And that is that Michael not only is the one who will deliver God's people, God's living saints at the end from the death decree, but he is also the one who performs the work of resurrection, just like Moses. Notice Daniel 12 verses 2 and 3, immediately after Daniel 12 verse 1, where it speaks about Michael delivering the living saints, then he's going to deliver those who died from the tomb, those who died in Christ. Daniel 12 verse 2 and 3, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, that's the righteous who died before Jesus came, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So Michael is not only going to deliver the living saints from the death decree, he's also going to deliver those who died in him. He's going to deliver them from the grave where they went when they died before the second coming of Christ. Let's cap it all off with 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 15 through 17. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, that is the living saints that are going to be delivered by Michael, those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, that is those who died in Christ. For the Lord himself will descend. Who is the Lord himself? Well, obviously the Lord Himself here is Jesus. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, now listen carefully to this, with the voice of an archangel. Remember that the archangel Michael resurrected Moses? Now it says that He's going to come with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, that is Michael the archangel, and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Moses was a little sampling of the resurrection of all of the righteous at the end of time. And then we have this beautiful promise. It says, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, that is with those who died and resurrected in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What is the, at the heart of the message today? Folks, we talk about the terrible time of trouble that is coming. Some people say, I hope the Lord lays me to rest. It's going to be a very difficult time. I hope I don't have to go through that period because people are afraid. But we have a guardian angel who will protect us, and if we die, will resurrect us. So let's com be comforted with this wonderful message that God gives us in His Holy Word. Come and sing with us hymn number 85, Eternal Father Strong to Save. Yeah. 
Shall we pray? Father in heaven, as we conclude this worship service and as we see the world falling apart, we realize that our redemption is closer than what we believed. As the world falls apart, we have the tendency to be filled with fear and with anxiety because of the things that are coming upon the world. But Lord, thank you that we have a powerful Savior a powerful Michael, a powerful who is like God that intervenes, protects us, enlightens us, and empowers us to proclaim your message. Lord, I ask that you will help us not to fear, but to trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And we thank you for answering our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 